One of the feelings that I had during the, the tragedy in Paris this week, the, the, the priest who ran in and saved, as you say, the crown of thorns, I do not believe that to be the crown of thorns. You say it is the crown that rested upon Christ's head. I think it's a crown that Louis the Ninth bought at a bazaar in the Middle East 1,200 years after Christ. <laughs> uh, but I'm not only going to pick on Catholics, because that's not the entirety of my point. It's uh, only like 95. Yeah. By the way, Knowles' face was like just sheer yeah. disappointment when you said that. Knowles is like, please don't ask me on camera to say whether or not I think it's the crown I of think thorns. It, I absolutely think it's the crown Stop. of thorns. So... <laughs> so my, my can point. We, you and I can, can we yeah. go out and just have no, a drink no, no. together? My, <laughs> I want to have a serious conversation. Yeah, yeah. My, my point is that for hundreds and hundreds of years, millions yeah. and millions of yeah. people have made pilgrimage to, to behold the crown of thorns, to pray at the, at the foot of the crown of thorns. Yeah. They have, many of them have walked away from that having had transcendent religious experiences. Uh, others have probably walked away feeling that their prayer wasn't granted and lost their faith, right? Because human, human religiosity is a very complex thing. The, the experience of God, I am willing to grant, may very well be, and in, and in innumerable cases, in fact, is an authentic experience of God, though you couldn't pay me enough to say that the crown of thorns that was in Notre Dame Cathedral ever rested on the head of Christ. Similarly, in Israel is a garden tomb. And it's interesting, if you've ever been to Israel, there are Protestant uh, locations where certain things are said to have happened, and there are Catholic locations where certain things are said to have happened. And because Catholicism came, grew into, uh, into authority at a time when most people lived mean, meager, terrible lives in medieval Europe, when people spent most of their time outdoors, people, you know, like on Monty Python, they moved mud from one <laughs> hole to another hole. Uh, when they would walk into these great cathedrals, they had never seen anything like it. They didn't feel the presence of God when they saw a sunset. When they saw a sunset, what they felt was the onset of cold and fear. <laughs> darkness. And darkness. When they, but when they would make pilgrimage to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and they would see these gilded statues and these unbelievable buildings that took centuries to build that elevated the experience of what they were seeing. When I see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I'm not uh, uh, a medieval mud farmer and I'm not a papist. And so when I see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I don't feel any religious experience. When I go to the Garden Tomb, however, because I've spent my entire life in the West, indoors, air-conditioned, well-fed, when I see, oh, this is, this is what the scene would have looked like. This is the exact aesthetic. That transports me because I didn't, because evangelicalism and Protestantism came later when we had modernity. I'm being transported out of modernity to touch what once was. The result is millions of Protestants have made pilgrimage to the garden tomb uh, in, in Israel. And millions of them have had religious experiences praying at the foot of the tomb, uh, weeping at the foot of the tomb. They will say to you, there is no question. I visited the garden tomb. There is no question that that is where the resurrection took place because I felt God there. And yet, the garden tomb is almost certainly yeah. not the tomb of Christ. Almost certainly meaning there is less than a 1% chance that the garden tomb in Israel ever held the body of Christ. Millions of Protestants would be just as mad at me about saying that as would be Catholics for saying that the crown of thorns is not the crown of thorns. Well, you, you do have this great ability to offend okay, every everyone. single person. <laughs> yeah. But he, herein Why is the friends. question that yeah. I want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> the question that I, that I want to get each of you to, to weigh in on, because it, it really was kind of a startling and uh, an unsettling notion as I watched uh, that beautiful building burn. And I thought, what is it that... Or we, we each believe of our religion, and, and Judaism undoubtedly has similar problems. I'm just not expert to speak to them. Um, what is it that we believe that the God of Abraham actually identifies himself as truth? He is not only the God of truth, he is truth. The, the actual concept of truth is embodied in God. What does it say that his people can have authentic experiences of the God of truth through fabrication? through things that are themselves oh. almost certainly not true. Can I answer that? Please. All right. First, first, let me start with a story. When I was in Israel, uh, I had the same feeling as you. When I go to the Catholic sites and they tell me this is the place where this happened and I know it's not, I feel there's a sentimentality that goes against my nature. I'm not a sentimental person. 
When I was in the Mount of Olives, there's a church there called the Church of the Rock. Yeah. And in, it's built around a rock. And the rock is, by tradition, supposed to be the place where Jesus fell down, sweated blood, and prayed to God to let this cup of crucifixion pass from him. And I walked in, and as a, totally cynical, complete, walked around the corner and thought, oh my God, this is the place. Yeah. And I was imbued with the Spirit. It lasted for about an hour. I walked around in a kind of daze of, of, of yeah. inspiration. I don't know whether that's the place or not. But I know that on that telephone, I got a call. Jesus spoke in parables. Those parables are untrue. There was no man with two sons, one of whom became a prodigal and the other one stood. He knew there was no, that was an untrue story. And he told that story and yet, and yet when he told that story, he was giving you a telephone on which the spirit was calling. I have a lot of sympathy for that. I'm not a sentimental person and I'm not a superstitious person. And when I see things that aren't true, I have the same, you know I do, you know I have the same feeling of view of whoa, whoa, whoa. But when somebody's on the other end of the line, I pick up the phone. Yeah. And I think that parables, stories, fictions uh, are ways in which meaning comes to us. Is it a slight distinction though that the parable wasn't, when Christ told a parable, he said, here's a parable. He didn't say, this is true. It's not a slight distinction. It's an important distinction. Yeah. It, you know, there are certain kinds of stories you tell. There was a man who had two sons. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Right. Certain right. kind of stories, I saved two people from a, a burning building. It matters whether yeah, that's yeah. true or not. You know? so, so Brian Williams. We, we, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> he was there we, at the yeah. Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Right? We do want to distinguish between those stories, but we don't want to forget the fact that everything in a way is a story. Every life, life itself is a story and it communicates. I mean, I think this is the point of telling parables, by the way, I think this is what Jesus was saying when he told parables was not, oh, this is the meaning, but physical things have a meaning. Mm -hmm. And, and I yeah. think that when we live that way, we live in truth. And, and so I'm not, I'm not as alienated by the crown of thorns, which I'm with you. I don't believe that's the crown of thorns. I'm not as alienated by that when it communicates to somebody the truth of, of I think, the crucifixion. Uh, there's also, you know, for me, you know, I don't believe any of the stuff that you guys are talking <laughs> yeah. about, right? Yeah, well, you're going uh, to hell. I mean. Right, of course. I mean, this is, this is clear. Um, but when mm -hmm. Notre Dame burned, I was very upset about it. And yeah. Notre Dame has a pretty significant anti-Semitic history, yes. right? I mean, there, there are yes. statues there that talk about supersession of Catholicism over Judaism. The, the copies of the Talmud would burn right in front of, the, of Notre Dame in the 13th century. And still, I felt something. And the reason that I felt something was because we are all part of this same river of history in the civilization. Mm -hmm. And I owe something to even the people who persecuted my people living in a civilization that is built on those foundations. There's a lot of fossils in the fossil record here. Yeah. And that does not mean that I'm not standing atop a bunch of different layers of sediment. And, and so there, there's something to that. I think as far as your more basic question, which is you know, how do people get value from, from these things? You know, I, I think that there's something else to it. And that is we innately get value from things that other people have imbued with value. Yeah. Meaning that when I look at, at Notre Dame, the reason that that strikes me in a way that a new church burning would not is because that did take 200 years to build. Mm -hmm. And that was blood and sweat and tears of people. Those were people bringing ox carts full of stone mm -hmm. from far off lands to build this monument to well, God. 182 years. Yeah, over yeah. The, and, and there's, there's something deeply wonderful about the idea, especially in a society where everything is supposed to be given to us like right now, we want it mm -hmm. right now, yeah. and we're not supposed to think about tomorrow, there is no tomorrow, we're not supposed to even think about the national debt because that's too difficult for us to think about. Think about the idea that you're gonna start building a building that your great, great, great grandchildren will probably not live to see completed, but you're gonna start building it. To me, that's the story of civilization and the story of religion, mm -hmm. which is that you are not here to finish the task, you are here to begin the task. And so when you see people who have, have completed that task, and when you see people go and spend their money to go and worship at something even that I don't believe in, I think the fact that they are even going to pay homage to God using their own money mm -hmm. to pay homage to something that people have imbued with value, even if I think that the thing itself doesn't actually hold the value, that is a testament to the place that God holds in, in human hearts that is ineradicable. You cannot get rid of it. And I think secular society has tried to erase it and suggest that people don't have that innate need for God, that innate yearning for God. Yep. The yearning is still there. And without, without any fulfillment of the yearning, the unhappiness is the only thing that's left.